Hello friends and gamers, and welcome to The Fortress. The turn is July 1941, and peace reigns in Eastern Europe. Germany and USSR have maintained their non-aggression pact, and therefore we drift into very alternative history type of things. So that means that a lot of German income is going towards really pressuring the Allies and attacking all the neutrals that they can get, as well as building up a defense and a good industry for research roles and, and fortifying Europe in that sense. Russia, on the other hand, has done some very aggressive moves themselves uh, between attacking Norway and capturing it, between attacking Mongolia and capturing it, between sending Lendlease to CCP so they can overwhelm the KMT, and now with their build-up on other borders where they could threaten either other neutrals or allied nations. Now, they also have a fairly large transport fleet, which means that they could always threaten Britain as well. And lastly, we look over here, where when the Republicans won the Spanish Civil War, and the USSR player had the option to set up the units however they chose, at the end of the day, they chose to build much of their units that had push power, the aggressive power, to be on the southern border here against Gibraltar, as opposed to up north in a more defensive posture up here. So that's something to be looking at, for sure. And it really sinks home this idea of it is not Axis and Allies. It's Axis and Allies and common term. It's a three-way dogfight with no way of knowing whose side and how things are going to benefit out. We saw last turn where Russia then leased a fighter to Northern Italy, who is still neutral, but it is Axis. It is played by the Axis player, and there's no way for them to not join on the other side. And they will eventually join the Axis, at least to get the victory points at the very end of the game. We saw another very aggressive USSR turn which, uh, move, which was up here with three Soviet subs. This action by the Hilltop Pillbox will have some repercussions, which we will see shortly. But let's dive into our economy and move on from there. So before we start talking about what our purchases are, let's roll for our research. So we're doing two researches. We're doing um, wartime economy, and we're also doing long-range aircraft. So that is two dice rolls, and I believe they both have to succeed at seven. So here we go. And they both succeed. So that is excellent news for us. Um, a fantastic roll. We have, are now completed with wartime economy, and our long-range aircraft is also completed where we sit with the Japanese. So that is fantastic. We need, we need some of that much-needed money. <laughs> okay, so that makes me really happy. <laughs> Because I feel like I'm being picked on a little bit, well, which it makes sense though. I, I, I really don't mind. It makes for a very fun game. So I have 26 bucks to spend as the British. We're building two infantry and what is this? One, two, three, four, four militia. We're building a fighter in Canada and an anti-aircraft. So let me just pause for a second to talk about what that means. So in the Canada expansion, we have this historical thing called the Airdrome of Democracy, which people refer to Canada. We had a, you know, our military wasn't huge in Canada, but we did have a very profound supportive role in anti-convoy raiding, or anti, um, yeah, anti, uh, yeah, anti-convoy raiding, but as well as a lot of training programs for British pilots, British and French and Polish and Czech and whoever all pilots, we had them trained in Canada because they're free skies that you didn't have to worry about aggression from the Axis powers. So that's what this Aerodrome of Democracy is to represent. So each turn, eligible nations may build a single air unit at a 2 IPP discount and place in a territory not already training a unit. So that's what this is. So this is only costing us 8. Now in the eligibility, elig eligibility, major powers except USA, KMT, aligned with the Commonwealth. Britain is eligible. So I put that Britain is eligible just so that people thought, well, Canada is the same power as Britain. There, you know, is to get rid of confusion. But the intent behind that is for free France to also be able to utilize this. Because as it stands, as it stands, there's um, the only person that does benefit with the USA and the KMT out of the picture is Britain. Or because USA is the only other major power. Um, FEC, I believe, is not considered a major power. It's considered like a... I don't know, a minor, well, you know, it's an appendage of the British Empire. So it's not necessarily a major power. It's, it's, it's something to itself, right? It's like saying Eastern, Eastern USA is a major power and Western USA is another major power. So that's kind of the concept. So I need to rewrite these rules or, or request that um, 
one of the HPG staff, if they wanted to tackle it, to do this and, and change it up so that the free French has a chance to exploit this. Because at this point, it's not really that beneficial, and it's not like the free French have that much money to spend on fighters either. But if they happen to scratch themselves up to eight bucks per turn, it would really benefit them to build a fighter every other turn, let's say, something like that. So that's the idea. So that's what we're building here. In the Far East, we have 16 bucks to spend. We're starting an airfield. So that's a three bucks, three buck thing right here. And that's gonna be going into Calcutta. And then I'm building a stack of militia. So the yellow represents three. So three, four, five militia and an infantry is being built. And now Anzac is building an anti-aircraft and two militia, and Canada is land leasing a free French submarine and building one of their specialized infantry divisions. So either the Princess Paths or the Queen's Own Rifles. I can't remember which one I have on the board already. Now this could be built at any friendly factory. So American, free French, whatever, it can be built there. Now I still owe the Russians four bucks. But I believe they have violated the spirit of the agreement because at this point, why would I lend these to them if they're doing this very profound actions of threatening American and British convoy lines by moving their Soviet subs here? Because this, these units here have no way of impacting any German units from that position. None whatsoever. They, the only ones that they can impact, they can't engage these submarines because they'll just merge out of sight. The only other way, uh, only other parties that they'll engage is the Americans or the British convoy lines. Likewise, the USSR then leased to Northern Italy. That is what we would consider a hostile act, and therefore we are not fulfilling our, our lend lease uh, remainder of four bucks unless they do some actions to change that up on our behalf. Whether that means they send some lend lease to one of our nations, that's very much very much needed, or they back off against the KMT or they retreat these submarines to back into the Baltic Sea. That is the only conditions that we will do. And even this, you know, they would have to go a few, it would take them two turns. So we're not going to give them any, any of the remaining four bucks until they withdraw and do some less hostile actions. And even at that point, this fighter here is a clear indication of, of aggression against the Allies because the only people that they can be aggressive against is the Allied powers. So. That is our take on that, and I don't consider it a violation of our agreement because it is a proxy war. It is a proxy war, and therefore um, the spirit of it has been violated. That's as far as I would say. And uh, I apologize if that offends people, <laughs> specifically you, Hilltop. You're a great guy and all, but you know I have to do my best to kind of I have to do my best to win this war. And I think those actions there are uh, suitably aggressive enough that I can violate my terms as you have violated yours. That's what I would say on that regards. Now, um, there's only one aggressive action happening this turn, and that is with this strategic bomber. Now, the strategic bomber is going to be bombing these units in Macedonia. There's nothing here that can scramble against them, so therefore we're just straight up just going to roll for them. So, it has the range, especially now with a long-range aircraft, but there's an airbase here as well, so we can go one, two, three, four, and that still leaves us a range left of, what would it be? One, two, three, four left. One, two, three, so we, one, two, three, four, we could even land back in Gibraltar, which we probably will do, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So it's three die rolls at two and less that we have to succeed on. I've prepared this thing, so it's three at two. One success. Now, I will leave that up to Panzer King as to who he wants to remove. I'd imagine he wants to move one of the infantry or perhaps the cavalry. That's his choice at that point. But yeah, we have struck out, a, struck a successful blow against German aggression. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to pause the video while I plan out my non-combat moves. They are somewhat extensive. There's a lot of moving parts in this. As you all know, if you've played the British Commonwealth, there is always a lot happening. So bear with me, and I will be right back. All right, so I had to think about my non-combat moves, but before we get into that, I want to quickly rewind to the economic table. Now, I didn't collect my bonus income for last turn. I only just realized that now. So that is seven bucks. <clears throat> it's seven bucks because, well, I spent 26 bucks, which is what I was uh, on the board. 
and I get um, three bucks for Suez, two bucks for Iran, and two bucks for having nothing on the on the any Commonwealth lines. So that's seven bucks. So with seven bucks, I'm going to upgrade a militia to a uh, regular infantry. I'm going to build a militia and build another infantry. So three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven bucks. All right. So that's what's going on there. But let's quickly go to the com uh, non-combat move stuff. So I have organized this a little bit, a little bit to symbolize what I'm doing. So uh, uh, Andrew Cunningham has received his moving orders and has is going to sail across to sea zone 52 with the Royal Navy. Now the Royal Navy is all these units here. So three battleships, battle cruiser, two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, two destroyers, one torpedo destroyer, and uh, three transports. Now those three transports are going to carry some units. So they're going to carry this is one, two, three, four, five infantry, the Canadian Queen's Own Rifles, so that's six. So these six units are going to go across to Greece. Now, um, Greece is going to get crowded, so I'm going to set up a separate task force marker here for now. Um, yeah, just off camera right here. Unfortunately, just off camera. <laughs> and I'll move that a little bit later on. But I want to show you all what goes on to there. So those six units are going to be placed on there. Now also from Gibraltar I'm going to fly across um, this tactical bomber is going to land there and then also the air transport is going to carry some units across there to there as well. So that is six, six, six by sea, one by air in the tactical bomber. Now um, I'm also going to move the Greek mountain infantry to that tile and commanding this whole thing is going to be Claude Auchinlecht. I have a nice close up on him. So he's in Thessaly right now. Now that takes care of what's there. There'll be a couple more units going into there but for right now we'll leave it at that. Now this strategic bomber as you remember came one, two, three, four, five, six, six is normal movement, seven w from this air base here and eight because it has long-range aircraft so it lands all the way back here now um, that's what's going on there now to reinforce that position these ships under Andrew Fraser or Bruce Fraser sorry are gonna come one two three to sea zone 52 so that increases the amount of ships present in that zone and um, Bruce Fraser is gonna go on a fast mail packet to the British Islands. <laughs> okay, what else? Oh, uh, also, tucked in here is the Greek heavy cruiser that's also going to join that fleet. So that sums up. Oh, and one more thing. This Canadian transport is going to pick up one infantry, and so it's using its two capacity. It's going to go one, two, three, four, five to that position, and so the transport goes there, and over here we have one additional infantry placed there. So in total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven regular infantry, one airborne, one queen's own, an air transport, a tactical bomber, two uh, and two uh, mountain infantry in Thessaly. So that's what's going on there. Now, Cunningham has three battleships, a battle cruiser, two heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, sorry, one additional heavy cruiser, so three heavy cruisers, three light cruisers, one, two, three, four, four destroyers, an Anzac light cruiser, and three British transports, and one Canadian transport. That's what's going on there. Okay, now you see that there's these remaining ships. Well, that's what Bruce Cunningham is taking charge of. He's getting on board this heavy cruiser and grabbing these three ships, and they're sailing up to Sea Zone 22. So that is a light carrier, a heavy cruiser, and a destroyer to Sea Zone 22. Um, over here, this detachment of a light cruiser, and uh, sorry, a, a destroyer and a light carrier is going to go to Sea Zone 23, right there. So that's what's going on here, over there. Now, from London, you can't quite see, but from London, I'm going to fly the Canadian aircraft. It's going to go one, two, three, four and the British fighter is going to land here. This torpedo boat destroyer is going to swoon in here to sea zone 25. Sorry, 23. So in 23, destroyer, torpedo boat destroyer, light carrier, and a fighter. 
that's what's going on there. Now, hmm. Now, from the British Midlands, these three fighters are going to come down. One, two, three, four, five, to Gibraltar. So three fighters, two militia, one strategic bomber, and an Anzac artillery in Gibraltar. That's what's going on there. Now, uh, the British islands are going to be a bit of a mess, so let me make some order of it while, I, while we're looking in this direction. So I need to go around the table. We're going to move... We're going to rail this infantry to Scotland. We're going to rail one of these infantry to northern England. And we're going to move one militia there. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. One militia is going to go there. And one infantry... Oh, you know, that infantry will stay there. No, that infantry is going to come to here. So we'll have, uh, we'll have two militia and one infantry in Midlands. One infantry and a militia in Northern England, and in Scotland we have one infantry. Down here we have three militia and one airborne unit in London, guarding London. So that's what's going on over there. Now, let's take a glance in some other parts of the globe. I think that covers all that, to my knowledge. Now here, so this medium bomber has a range of five, so one, two, three, Four, five. It lands in eastern Egypt. And now I have, oops, these guys go here. So this Belgian Congo infantry is going to come to Sudan. And the Sudanese fellow is going to get railed all the way. I'm going to move this over here. He's going to get railed all the way to Transjordan, I believe. Yeah, Transjordan is where he's going to go. Mm -hmm. Transjordan. <laughs> had to pause and think about it for a second. So that's what that looks like. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, this um, this medium bomber could actually reach Travis Jordan, so it's going to come all the way... No, you know what? It's going to stay in Eastern Egypt. That's where it's going to go. Okay, I think that takes care of this part of the globe. Now we're going to go on to the Middle East. Now we have this... Um, submarine that's going to move, but for now we'll let, look at the land forces. So this airborne is going to wander over to Iraq, that's his destination, and one of these units is going to rail using our new built rail to Calcutta. And that's it for there. Now this submarine is going from 84 to 123, which is at Sarawak. So it can range 1, 2, 3, 4. It can get there. Now um, what's happening here? So this Anzac transport is in a bit of a pickle. It, you know, we're expecting it to be attacked next turn, so we don't want to lose that if we, if we don't have to. So it's going to go back to Australia. It's going to go one, two, three, four, five, because we still have strategic naval capacity. It's going from this place all the way down there in 145. All right, now while we are here, these two militia, one walks into there and the one rails into Sydney as well. We ought to make sure that we protect Sydney. Uh, it's got a factory. If you hold Sydney, you can probably hold these two territories, but if, you f if Sydney falls, then it gets really difficult to hold on to that. Now, while we're here, scope up here. So we're going to move this yeah, I think that can stay there. Yeah, well, okay, we're going to move this coastal submarine to that position. And we're going to go one, two, three to this position there. Off the, oh, sorry, not quite on camera, but that's off of Sarawak. That's what's going on there. Yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, all right. Yeah, that's, that's it for that. So um, you've seen all my movements I'm going to be making here, and I think we're going to go straight to, non, uh, to place unit phase. So place unit phase. Place unit phase, we have a couple little options going on here. Now for place unit phase, we will um, start with the Anzac, since we're looking at them. They have two militia and one infantry to place on the board. So for them, it's pretty simple. They have one factory, so the... Uh, sorry. 
two, <laughs> two anti-aircraft and two militia. So the anti-aircraft in Sydney and the two militia in Sydney as well. It's very, very heavily defended, but there's reasons for that. It's well worth defending. <laughs> okay, next up we have the Far East Command. Now the Far East Command is a little bit tricksy, just because they've got a few odd units here and there lingering around. So Far East Command, we're going to be building at their factory one infantry, and in they had five militia to spend. There they are. And they're building their uh, air base as well. It's also going to go in Sydney. Sorry, Calcutta. I keep getting all the names wrong now. Now, this is the Hong Kong forces. I've condensed them a little bit before. They're a little bit um, spread all over the place, but now they're condensed. So in Hong Kong, I'm allowed to build two militia. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So now I have six militia in Hong Kong. And I have three militia left to spend. Now those militia I'm going to place in Calcutta. That's what's going on there. Uh, heavily defense of Calcutta, uh, with reason too. I think I expect the CCP are going to come in my direction. I I think this is this unholy alliance between the communists and the Axis is going to stand and going to carry forth for a few more turns. So that's what I that's what I predict and see at this stage. All right. So that brings us to the next uh, place interface which will be here. So Iran, I would consider Iran still part of the of the Western Hemisphere. Now that's debatable, but usually in, in Axis and Allies, I believe it was Iran was part of the European side of things. So with them, I'm going to be placing a militia, oh sorry, infantry is going to be placed here in Southern Iran. I'm going to be placing a militia here in Azerbaijan and a militia in Southern Iran as well. So just start to defend that factory a little bit. Now we scope our way over here. Now here, here we're going to be placing one infantry in southern Africa. Uh, my son wants to join me. <laughs> Poor guy. He misses me. <laughs> and now I feel really bad for him. Okay, so I'm going to upgrade one infantry here in, uh, in eastern Egypt. Sorry, one militia is going to be upgraded here in eastern Egypt. Okay, so that takes care of that, I believe. So I had one militia, one infantry. Yeah, I think that takes care of that. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't, because there's still a couple more infantry to spend on the board. Hmm, I just grabbed some stuff off and then I was distracted, so <laughs> I don't remember. Okay, now we have a few more militia to spend, and I believe two more infantry. Yeah, two more infantry to spend. So two infantry should be pretty easy. Yeah, that's what it was. I remember now. Two more infantry. So we're looking at England now. So I'm going to be placing the anti-aircraft in London. And I have two infantry to, spend, uh, to place here. So it's going to be both are in London as well. Now I have three militia to spend on here. So I'm going to be placing one up north in Scotland, Scotland the Brave, and one here in Northern England. And uh, then I'm going to be placing one more militia in London because militia uh, London is well worth holding. And in Canada, I'm going to be placing our special Aerodrome of Democracy unit up there in Quebec. Now. For Canada, I still have a couple more units to spend, so um, Canada can place its Princess Patricia's here in London because it uses a friendly factory, and they're lend leasing. They're, they're lend leasing a submarine here to Sea Zone One Zero Five. That is it. Um, that is all my place unit phase. So let's go quickly to collect income. So collect income, we have our. 26 that we're getting for Britain, plus 7 of their bonus. We're getting 16 for the Far East Command. We're getting 9 for Anzac, combined with the one that they had left over. And 9 for Canada, combined with the one they have left over. Now we also get peacetime income increase. So that is going to be interesting because I'm not yeah. sure who that goes to. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I think it might go towards... It might go towards whoever I choose it to go to, but I'll have to look into that. So it's two dice at six. Ten. That's awesome. 
I love me some good high numbers. So 10 bucks, which I have to look into who I can give that to. Um, I believe it would be Britain, but perhaps it's not. Okay, my little guy is reaching across. Hi, Felix. Hi, welcome back. He was away with his mom at the mother-in-law's. <laughs> all right, so that takes care of all my non-combat and place unit phase. So stay tuned for the French turn, which will be quite brief. Actually, I'll just dive right into it. So the French had four bucks to spend. And so these are their units that they're going to be placed. So it's only one infantry that they're going to place. Now, uh, with their one, well, let me quickly adjust the map here because my stuff got all shifted around. So they're doing actually quite a few combat stuff, but it's all very minuscule. So this infantry is coming there, this cavalry is coming there. So we're going to pick up those two territories. Over here, this cavalry is going to zip over here to Dahomey. Pick that one up. And these two units are going to combat move one, two, three. And they're going to drop two infantry off in Cameroon. That's what's going on there. Now, um, for place unit phase, I think that's... Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, for non-combat, they have this fighter... Is, uh, sorry, medium bomber is going to go one, two, three, four, five, and land with Aachenlex forces over here. And um, this submarine is going to go one, two, three, four, and go to C Zone 24 off the coast of uh, England, of Cornwall. Now, for place unit... You may have noticed this before, but there was one free French unit here sitting in Syria. Well, that was by accident. It's being placed right now. Yeah. That's okay, sweetie. And uh, for so their income goes up. So I had one buck left over, and their income goes up to six, and the Vichy French goes down to one. So with six and um, the little bit that we collect, we're now collecting seven bucks of income for the French this turn. That is it. Oh, oh yeah, sorry. One more non-combat move which would be these, Whoa. these two ships. And so these two ships are going one, two, oops, sorry, one, two, three, off the coast of Sarawak as well. Down there. So there's two free French, um, uh, a British, and an Anzac. And that is it. So everybody else, check out Panzer King's channel next, and he will have the Italian turn. Now, will he engage the British forces, the Royal Navy? We are still having superiority of forces. Not by much, especially with that Russian lend lease that they sent to Northern Italy, but we have a small margin. Small margin. The difference is um, we, will, we would probably win that fight if the, if the odds work in our favor, which or, or the average works in our favor, which it probably would to some extent. But the Italian fleet would be absolutely decimated whereas the British fleet can still stumble from this and recover and uh, not be too hampered by that. Because realistically, all we have to worry about, I mean, the Italians are doing a pretty good job in checkmating all of our forces here and making us preserve all our strength here. If it wasn't for, you know, even if we wiped each other out mutually, then it would be, uh, I would still have quick dominance by moving some forces back into the Mediterranean. But um, that's neither here nor there. It's just speculation. So we shall see how it pans out. Thank you all for watching. Cheers.